Father, I come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit with thanksgiving for another privilege and opportunity to gather together in this fashion and worship you by feasting on your word. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this time together, filtering out all the foolishness and ignorance but opening our hearts to the truth that you want us to know. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In this series of videos, we've been studying together in the second epistle to the Thessalonians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we'd reached the ninth verse, I believe, of chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. In uh, part 2, we looked at the justice of God, and the word translated vengeance in verse 8 is, isn't, is really, uh, we shouldn't consider that in our minds as one of revenge, but of the execution of justice, that God will execute justice on those who don't know Him and who do not obey the good news concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is absolutely crystal clear on the fact that God has a family and Satan has a family. I pointed uh, to Christ sowing his seed and Satan sowing his seed in Matthew chapter 13 on numerous occasions that there are plants that he didn't plant, that our Lord didn't plant. We have the testimony of Christ himself speaking of the sons of the devil and the sons of the kingdom and God executes justice. In both cases, God is just in bringing judgment upon those who are the sons of the devil and that he's also just with respect to us, to his own children. That's why I have a, a, a very difficult time understanding how that any believer in Christ can doubt so, such, so great a redemption. That's the wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ. I preach the gospel unto you. The Holy Spirit says in Corinthians that Jesus Christ was delivered for our sin according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't that you ought to do something, you know, or, you know, hey, I've got, hey, I've got really good news for you. You know, if you just do this or that or the other thing, that uh, if if you just if you accept it as good news, you know uh, that that you need to uh, do something to be redeemed, whether it's uh, uh, believe, receive, accept, be baptized, or anything else. No, I have good news for you. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Where is it, where is there anything for you to do in that statement? according to the scriptures. Whether you are one of the we or uh, and the our or the you, I don't know, but you do. Or you should do. You should know. I've, I've, uh, I don't know how many videos I've done uh, sharing with you folks, you dearly beloved children of God, what I believe to be the gospel. One is redeemed not by anything that they did. They're born again, not by their will. That ought to be clear. We weren't born physically by our will. We're not born spiritually by our will. And just as God executes justice upon those who do not know God, He has rendered justice for those who do we don't, we don't get away with sin. Our sins were placed on Christ. It is just 
that you believe God, that you will never perish, that you have eternal life and that you'll never perish. We all have to stop and realize that. Imagine, folks, that Christ incarnate, he suffered the just payment for our sin. Christ, the one who created, who spoke the, heaven, the worlds into existence, who created the heavens, who cannot sin, who could not sin, he became incarnate and he was made sin for us. He didn't sin, but he was made sin for us that God's justice might be satisfied. God is propitiated. God has nothing against you. And that's from the least to the greatest of you out there. He doesn't look at you as condemned, but uncondemned. There, there is therefore now no judgment, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he was made sin for us in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, were we? Yes, we were. The way God executed justice, in our case, was by dying in our place. It's clear from our present text here that He didn't die for, for everybody. He did not die in every man's place. If He did, if, if Christ Jesus was made sin for every man, then every man is made righteous. Made the righteousness of God in Him and therefore there could not be any execution of judgment and flaming fire and punishment with everlasting destruction. As far as, as, as those for whom he did not die, it is everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. That's us and to be admired in that day in all them that believe, that's us, because our testimony among you was believed, says Paul to the Thessalonians. We've seen from this present study here that the rapture must precede this coming in, in which every eye shall see him return with his mighty angels in flaming fire. We, we didn't see any of that, none of that, in Paul's mention of the rapture. It will be after the great tribulation of those last days. That's not the same coming as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you don't believe that, then you cannot be looking for the coming of the Lord. You must be looking for the great tribulation period and the Antichrist. When he shall come to be glorified in those whom he has set apart, that is, in his saints. In those whom he has set apart, in his saints. When he shall come to be glorified in those whom he has set apart. You know, folks, it is so easy to read that and say that, well, those saints are people who live good lives. You know, pe people we should honor, like like the like like the like the Roman Catholic Church uh, nominates people for sainthood, where that they have you know one who argues against it, you know, a prosecutor and another defender who defends it, where that they then finally decide whether or not they can elevate somebody to sainthood. A saint, folks, is one who has been set apart by God. By one offering, he has perfected forever those whom he has set apart. Hebrews chapter 11. God set us apart. You know, I mean, he set pots and pans apart in the Old Testament to be used in the service of the Lord. Uh, other things are, are set apart. Sainthood has nothing to do with how we live. And yet, here's a a whole professing system that professes to be Christian that's elevating people upon what they do rather than on what Christ did. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are one whom God has set apart for Himself. You are a saint. 
Now, don't expect the world to believe to see that, to believe that, or believe you when you tell them that. But that is who you are, one who has been set apart. When he shall come to be glorified, admired in all those, all those who believed. And all of those folks are passive voices. All of them, when he shall come to be glorified. He is not glorifying himself. His glory is made manifest in those whom he has set apart. So, I got a little bombshell here for you. And uh, as usual, I don't ask anyone to agree with me. I've never really insisted on, on, on any of you agreeing with me on anything, even what I'm about to say, but I, I would, I would, I would, I'd like... I would love it if you folks would just listen to me, what I'm about to say, and at least chew on it for a little while before you automatically dismiss it as, well, that just can't be true. Dearly beloved, Jesus Christ is not glorified by how you live. But but because you have been redeemed by his death, burial, and, and resurrection. He's glorified because he died in your place, a substitutionary death. He will be glorified in whose obedience? Yours or his? His. He is not glorified in your, through your obedience or your doing anything. Think of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God is manifest, the righteousness of God which is made clear in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Think of it. That's the revelation of God's righteousness. How could God be righteous if He had not put away our sin? He's going to be admired. He's going to be glorified in those whom He has set apart because, why? Because they are the ones who believe in Him. God is glorified by our belief, by the ones in the, in the lives of those whom He has set apart, and He has granted faith to believe. What appears in the lives of those whom He has set apart is the righteousness of God. The obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not headed for heaven because you, well, because you did anything. You're not headed for heaven because you obey. You are headed for heaven because He obeyed and He was faithful. Christ was faithful. God is faithful. And it will be among all you who are believing. There won't be any missing. There, there isn't one single one who belongs to Christ who will be missing. If you are involved in missionary work, if you stand out on a street corner uh, telling others about Christ and what He's done for you, I've got great words of comfort for you. All right? A thousand years from now, Nobody whom God has destined for heaven will be in hell. That, that ought to be some good news to your ears. They'll all be in heaven. And nobody who is not destined for heaven will be in heaven. And you can rest in that. Well, Steve, why go to the mission field then? Because you love Him. If you would rather trust in man's effort than God's sovereign power, well, my advice to you folks is to stay home. Jesus Christ said, I give unto all my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. Perish If just one of them perishes, just one, God's a liar. Christ cannot be trusted. It's all of those that believe. Not some of them that believe. It's all of those that believe. Not in those who really believed and attained some, some kind of, of human sainthood.
how can anybody stand up and say, well, if you will believe, you'll go to heaven. When you can't believe, unless it's been given you of the Father. This is why I said unto you, no man can come unto me except it be given him of my Father. Why are those, so, those words of our Lord, our Lord, those are His words, not my words. Why are they so hard to understand? Be, because we desperately want to lay claim to at least some merit in coming to Christ. The only ones that come to Christ are those who are already His. If you're not His sheep, you can't believe. If you are His sheep, you will believe. Think of it, dearly beloved. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be made apparent, manifest in all of us who believe, who are His sheep, who are the plants that He planted. If you're a new creation in Christ, you'll be part of that evidence that exalts and admires and brings great praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what He did. These are His redeemed people. The glory is all His, not ours. Wherefore, verse 11, Also we pray always for you that our God would make you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of, of His goodness and the work of faith in power. The word is uh, count in my Bible, count you worthy, but its, it's construction in the Greek indicates he would, he would make you worthy of this calling. And most Christians want to argue that our worthiness is dependent upon how we live. And if we really do a good job, if we really work hard at it, well, then we're worthy. But the worthiness we're looking at here is the good pleasure of His goodness. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Where are your works in that? Where did you have anything to do with that? Where is that dependent in any way upon what you did or do or believe or think or, or whatever? God is the one who makes us worthy of this calling. Dearly beloved, we are to walk worthy of our position in Christ. Well, how do we do that? We, we don't walk to become what we already are. It'd be like me going out here and telling my horse, you know, that if you know, you'll be a horse if you just act like a horse. Look, my horse knows to act like a horse. That's I don't even think the whole, my horse knows that he's a horse, but he but he just he simply acts according to his nature. Folks, we are new creations in Christ. We don't walk in a way to become what we already are. I mean, it's to me, it's the it's it's the epitome of stupidity. Pardon me for saying so. We don't walk to become worthy if we're worthy. If God, if we have been made worthy, we don't walk to become worthy. We walk worthy of our calling. The calling's already there. He makes us worthy, and we ought to live like that. We ought to live like He is working all things together for our good. We ought to live like He's working in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. He said that He would never leave us nor forsake us. After we've been tested, we shall come forth as gold. You're not going to come forth as gold because you lived a good life or because you obeyed or you did this, that, or the other thing. You will come forth as gold, folks, because He died in your place. Because He is the one who made you righteous. Because He was made sin on your behalf. The work of faith in power. The work of faithfulness. The word faith there is a genitive. Faithfulness. Work. Faithfulness's work in power. It belongs to faith. It, it, it's so easy to make faith and faithfulness something that depends on us. Again, I quote from Romans chapter 3, But now the righteousness of God separate from the law is being manifest, witnessed by the law and what? And the prophets. The prophets. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. His faith. Now, if you've got a modern translation, it says faith in Jesus Christ. You won't find the word in there in the Greek. It says from or by Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you one simple question. Just one simple question. Where is your faithfulness made apparent, manifested by the law and the prophets? Please tell me where, where in the law or in the prophets your faithfulness is manifested. But Christ's is. Christ is. He's the lamb without spot. He's the innocent lamb slain for the guilty. From when Adam sinned all down through the law, the sin of the people was placed on the sacrifice. A substitutionary sacrifice. Who was an innocent lamb. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ is witnessed in the law and the prophets. He was made sin for us. Our sins and iniquities were placed on Him. Folks, they've been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea. God says, I remember them no more. And yet, I don't know how many Christians that I meet day after day whose sole preoccupation is with sin, is on the sin in their life. How could it be so wonderful a fact? Because He was faithful. Because Christ was faithful. That's how we were made righteous. Because of His faithfulness. That's the faithfulness that I believe that's referred to here in verse 11. The work of faithfulness is the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In power. In power. Not your faith in Him but His faithfulness. Why? Because we as sinners could not pay that sin debt. No matter how we lived, no matter what we did, we couldn't pay that debt. We stood condemned without hope. But Jesus Christ was faithful. He who knew no sin, who left the glory of heaven and was willing to die in our place, He was faithful. And because of His work of faithfulness, God can make us worthy of this calling. And our whole entire lives, folks, our existence here below is one in which we believe God is faithful. We don't trust in our own faithfulness. Our confidence, folks, is not in the fact that, well, maybe we'll be faithful. I'll go, God, I hope I'm faithful. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Again, it's a passive voice. We are not glorifying the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You might as well say that the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Why? Because He's faithful. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of God, not according to how you live. We don't glorify God, folks, by how we live. The problem is people seem to think that I'm all right. Well, Stu, God, I'm, I can hear it now. People think that I'm arguing that you don't have to care about how you live. And folks, I don't understand that. People have come to me and they've said, Steve, you teach the sovereignty of God. If you believe God is sovereign, well, then why study? Why spend any time in Bible study at all? Why not just, well, go play golf? God is sovereign. He's going to do what He wants. He's, he's going to do what He wants in your life. is isn't going to make any difference in your life whether you study or you don't. It won't make any difference in your life whether you work hard or you don't work hard. God is sovereign. God's working in you to will and do of His good pleasure. And I look at people in amazement. Well, first of all, I, I don't I don't play golf, and if I did, I wouldn't be any good at it. I don't I don't study, folks. I don't study the scriptures because I, I don't think God is sovereign. No, I know He's sovereign. There's only one reason I study the scriptures. He told me to. He's my loving heavenly father. 
I don't study this book, folks, because if I don't do it, he's not sovereign. He told me to do it. I have no activity in my life that calls into question the sovereignty of God. I believe he is absolutely, if, you, if you've watched this channel at all, you know that I believe that he is absolutely, supremely sovereign. I don't think there's a Christian alive that believes in the sovereignty of God as strong as, as I do. He's absolutely, supremely sovereign. No matter what I do, God's will will be done. I study because He told me to. I try to walk worthy of my calling because He told me to. Why is that so strange? I know He's sovereign. He could, he could buck me off my horse and flip me ten times and land me in South Africa, okay, if He wanted to. I can't imagine anybody marrying somebody and saying, you know, I, I love you and and I, I really do love you, but, that, but that's it. I'll never talk to you again. You know, I would think that, you know, if, if you love somebody, you'd want what they want. God has Paul say, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Okay? Well, let's, let's, let's see. Let's see here. Now, if, if, they're, if they're elected... If they're elect, God's elect, they're if going to heaven, why should He endure all things for them? I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain, also obtain, they're already elect, they're already redeemed, that they may also obtain the salvation, that is deliverance, Sozo, in the Greek, deliverance, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. They're already His elect. My answer to, to any of that criticism is I walk with Him because He asked me to, or He told me to. I study His Word because He told me to. I search the Scriptures because He told me to. I preach the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ because He told me to. It, doesn't, it does not impugn on His sovereignty. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one to be glorified. And He's going to be glorified in us, glorified by what He's done in us and, and us in Him. And it's done according to, by means of the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is manifested, is a means by which Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, folks, is glorified. What wonderful peace to know that He's paid it all, that we are His, and that we'll always be His. Oh, may that peace May that confidence, may that rest be the possession of all those who listen. In Christ's name I pray. Oh, dearly beloved, if you are a believer, believe what He said. These are certainly difficult times that we're going through. Perilous times that we're living through. I ask for your continued prayers for this ministry, but not only this ministry, I ask for your continued prayers for those who are hurting, our brethren everywhere, who are hurting, who are suffering in some way or the other, uh, that God in His supreme sovereignty is allowing them to suffer for their good. I ask for your continued prayers for relief and healing healing and comfort on those who are sick, that God would supply all their needs, which I believe He is. I think we can thank Him for that. I, but I continue to ask you for prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart, all of you, for all of the kind comments and the feedback that, that I receive from these videos. I want to thank you for all of your love, your messages of encouragement and support. 
Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.